great. I think we'll get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. It's really hard to speak, actually, after that, isn't it? Um, I still feel really quite emotional, I think. Um, maybe for you guys it was a, a party, but for us in the audience it was kind of a feast, right, for our <laughs> pandemic-starved souls. So it's, it's wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful, and it's wonderful to be able to talk about it a bit more now, this wonderful experience uh, that we all just got to have. I'm Emily Abrams Ansari. I'm Assistant Dean of Research here at the Faculty of Music. And it's my pleasure with this event, that's starting now, <laughs> to launch our first event in a new series called Talking Music, in which uh, members of the Don Wright Faculty of Music faculty will share with the community and with our students and with the, the broader London community some of the research that's happening in the Faculty of Music. Now, in music, research takes many forms. For some of us, research involves books and libraries and archives and scores. For some of us, research involves writing music. And for some of us, research involves playing music. And I'll be grateful that we have some colleagues who are involved in that last pursuit. And today, obviously, we're going to be focusing on the last of those. And I'm excited to welcome, uh, to join the octet on the stage today, my colleague, Dr. Jonathan D'Souza, who's a music theorist here at Western. And he's going to be leading the group in a conversation today about chamber music, which is very apropos as his area of research is, I guess, the, the magic that happens in our brains and bodies when we make music um, on our own and especially with other people. Um, so I'm very excited um, to, to introduce Jonathan and the Octet to you today for the first event in this series. Thank you all so much for coming. Well, uh, thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone who is uh, uh, sticking around for this conversation, either here in the hall or out there on the internet. Um, and thanks to all the performers for agreeing to, to, to stick around and to do this. Um, uh, I don't know that I'm exactly going to be leading a conversation, but I have a few kind of things that I can put out there and then we can talk about them and just kind of uh, see, see where it goes. But I thought just to get the ball rolling, um, although there were kind of brief introductions before the concert, or I guess in between the two pieces, maybe we could just go around the horseshoe and each person can just kind of just, again, introduce yourself, just very briefly who you are, maybe if you want to add in kind of when you first really encountered this piece, like as a player or as an audience member or so on. But if that doesn't seem interesting, just, you know, you can just say who you are. That's fine. We'll skip that too. <laughs> it's, all, it's all open ended here. We're just going to see where we go. So, all right. Um, uh, thanks, Jonathan. And uh, so my name's Scott uh, St. John. I'm a violinist. I'm actually from London, Ontario. Um, it's always a great pleasure to have a group like this to play with. It's so much fun. Um, and thanks to Sharon for arranging uh, the, all the musical and the musical. <laughs> it's, it's actually, it's funny to think about, you know, how many times the Mendelssohn Octet comes up in, it, it's funny, maybe not so much in an academic setting, but in a chamber music festival setting, it comes up uh, an enormous amount because it's a joyful piece, it's fun to play, um, everybody knows it. Um, at least, you know, a lot of folks have played many different parts of it. Um, and so I know for sure that I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure we read it in, in school. And then it showed up like right away on, you know, one of my first professional gigs where I think I played second viola. And I loved it. It was like the best experience ever. And so ever since then, it's, uh, I actually still have a real soft spot for the second viola part. Uh, not just because <laughs> my wife is playing it, but... <laughs> anyway, okay, here's her. Where do you want to go? Move in? Pong? We, we, sure, we could sure. ping pong, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Tom Viba, and I'm, I'm here at Western, and associate professor of cello here. And um, my uh, first encounter with the piece I was, I was sort of a, a late bloomer and a, and a late comer to chamber music, and I would have been about 18. And I think it was on RCA, there was this uh, recording of the Tokyo Quartet and the Cleveland Quartet playing Mendelssohn Octet. And, the, and they were on the cover, there were 
dressed in their, their concert performance, I thought, what an amazing idea of seeing these two great quartets facing off against each other or, <laughs> <laughs> or playing together and, and then hearing it, of course. I wanted to play it. And I, like Scott said, I, I read it as a student and didn't actually perform it until after I was a student. But that was my first encounter. And I actually, actually got to study with both quartets in my studies, so that, uh, that made it a bit more of a personal connection. Okay, we'll go back to you. <laughs> my name is Erica Rom, and I, uh, I'm, I live in Toronto, but my husband is on faculty here at Western in the uh, composition department, Omar Daniel. And um, yeah, I, I can't remember the first time that I heard it or played it. I, uh, it's, it's been many, like everybody here, it's been many times, and um, these two fabulous musicians are new to me. I've just met them, but everybody else on this stage I've played with so many times for the past 30 years in every possible combination. And, and that's kind of the way this piece kind of goes because you, as a violinist, you, you know, you, whichever part's handed to you, that's the, the part that you play. So it's, it's just this movable thing, you know, where you're, you're kind of mixing and mingling and, and it's all kind of magical, apart from the fact that you sometimes make wrong entries because you're not sure which part you're playing. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's just like, you know, all of these cross currents and relationships and it, it kind of just reminds me of the musical community in general, how we all interact over the years. Yeah, and that's kind of wonderful to not remember a first encounter, just to have it be something you kind of feel like you've always known, right? That's kind of great too. Uh, hi, I'm Sharon Way. I teach viola here at Western and um, yeah, I also can't remember the first time I ever heard or played this, but but I do know that unlike the violinist, I only play the second viola part. I <laughs> never even venture to the first part. I always request second viola because that, that's what I know and what I love. Um, I think uh, when I was pregnant, actually, I was, I was Scott's groupie on one of his tours and they played, I think, 10 concerts of Mendelssohn Octet. And, uh, and each one was more and more fun, and I was getting more and more jealous sitting in the audience, thinking, oh, I really want to be part of this group. And then the very last concert, I remember, they, um, I think you guys had some joke about, oh, well, we'll just try that at the last concert. And there were so many shenanigans at the end, and I just thought, oh, oh to... The, the, the two cellists switched. That's right, the two cellists cello. switched at the last movement, and so it was a different cello coming in. And, then. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so fun, and to know a piece that well, and I was, okay, one of these days I'm going to program this and I'm going to get to play this with Scott and with all of our friends. And, uh, and I was so pleased that Annie and Misha came to join us all the way from Germany too. We had played in Manitoulin Island together a few years back and it was so natural to play together that it was just, it was so fun that, that you guys could come. Um, hi, I'm Anne-Marie Moorcroft and I'm from London, Ontario. And I grew up playing with Scott. Um, I can't remember the first time. I also, it's, uh, I think we had a record with St. Martin's in the Fields. I don't, I don't know. But it's always been a piece I loved. And I'll never forget when I first uh, understood how young Mendelssohn was when he wrote it. I think he was 16. And it just has that, that youthfulness. And it's nice to be um, over 50 and still find that, that joy. <laughs> it doesn't go away. Um, yeah, I've played it so many times, and I think um, I have also played more second viola, but the last time I played first viola was t exactly 20 years ago. And we did a Home for the Holidays concert, Scott and um, Jennifer Orchard and Jeff, Jeff Nuttall and uh, Ingrid Sweetie. We were all students of Richard Lawrence who taught here in London way back when, when we were all children, and that was a wonderful reunion. And I have to say, I have a, a reunion kind of feeling, even though I'm playing with so many of you for the first time, it was just wonderful. Hi, I'm Annalie petty Patanakun, and I grew up in Calgary, Alberta, but I currently live in Toronto and teach um, on the faculty at the University of Toronto. Um, I, I think, similar to Erica's statement, I mean, other than Annie and Misha, I, I've known these people for a very long time, especially Scott. <laughs> we were very young teenagers when we first met. Um, but as Tom was saying, I, 
when I f was in the middle of my undergrad, I was attracted, actually even earlier than I was attracted to chamber music right from the beginning. I was doing the international competitions, but I don't know, I found a piano trio and I just fell in love with it and that was pretty much my life. So I have, I'm a bit embarrassed, but we're amongst friends here, right? <laughs> I've probably played this piece the least <laughs> because uh, you mentioned, Scott mentioned, coming to festivals, and that's what we would do, but very rarely am I on my own. I'm always with my trio, so I, I haven't had the chance to, uh, so whenever I do get this moment to play this piece, I'm just, and I love playing with other people, because again, I love my colleagues, but I learn so much every time I'm with these guys, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Misha Meyer from Germany. Um, we both uh, play and work in Berlin. Uh, mainly, well, we're in the orchestra, so we, that's our main job, but luckily we have uh, lots of chamber music opportunities there too. We also play in a quartet together, so um, this music is very close to us. Um, I don't remember, I think it wasn't, I think it was while I was at university when I played this the first, so it was quite late in my life, and I quite vividly remember this setup that we had a quartet and then we, we uh, and were joined by other people. And actually, I, uh, I think what is so beautiful and nice about this today is that everybody knows this, this piece so well, they could just play it. And it's like just like talking to each other. It's not really like mm -hmm. rehearsing. It's not really about that. But in my past, I, I remember quite well, how if you don't know the piece, then it's a lot of work. So I just remember like days and days of practicing, rehearsing this piece and it can be really, really a struggle because it's like so many voices and everything is too loud always, like so everything <laughs> is, never works, yeah? And it, who has the leading voice and so it's just marvelous the way you guys play and it's so easy, it's, it's uh, a joy. Uh, I'm Mark, uh, Mark Fewer, and I'm also at the University of Toronto where I teach alongside my colleague Anna Lee here. And I also don't remember when I first heard this piece, but it, I, as everyone is saying that, it makes me aware that it just, it's now deeply in all of our psyches, like some other parts of the repertoire, and we all come to it with our own experiences and our own backgrounds, and that's part of the fun of joining a team to play this piece. However, <laughs> I am reminded, as people are talking about their memories of the, of the work, I am reminded that maybe maybe a dozen years ago or 15 years ago. At, at, a, at that point in my life, I was playing at a music festival regularly in a string quartet alongside Scott and, uh, and, and two other people, and we were regularly playing as a quartet at this festival. And in fact, we played here in London at one point. Um, and we were playing the Mendelssohn Octet alongside another string quartet, which shall remain nameless, but their initials are the Prajak String Quartet. <laughs> and, and, um, and, I'm, and we walked out on stage to perform that, and we had never actually gotten through the whole piece in rehearsal. Do you remember that, Scott? You're, yeah. <laughs> However, that performance was off the charts great. It was really, it was terrific. I mean, we, we literally didn't actually run the whole piece, and we walked out to perform it, and it was, it was a great group. It was just, it was a great performance. Then five days later, I was at another festival in the U.S., with eight individual personalities, all person for person stellar players, and the artistic director of that festival had given the ensemble eight hours of rehearsal time, which we sadly used because it was the worst performance of the Mendelssohn Octet <laughs> that I ever participated in. And I, I thought about that over the years a lot, and I, I am convinced that because this piece is the way it is, and it has its history, that people like us, most of us are old, old friends, um, and now new friends who are soon to be older friends as well. Um, it, you, if you have too much time in front of you, it's, there's, an, there's an old saying, which I think is pretty true for a piece like this, it's either two rehearsals or 20. And I think that's really the way it works for a piece like this, for a caliber group like this, you know, this kind of caliber group. So anyway, I, I really, guys, just to say it out loud, I, I loved uh, the experience of putting this together, so thank you all for it, yeah. Well, we, had, we loved watching it I and mean, listening to it. This is amazing. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I'm Jonathan D'Souza. I, I teach music theory here, but I'm kind of a music theorist, historian. I do some music cognition stuff. I kind of 
mix and match. And I feel like the kind of extra additional kind of 10th participant in this whole conversation is Felix Mendelssohn, right? Who couldn't be with us today for um, <laughs> obvious reasons. But um, uh, fascinating, a fascinating figure, a fascinating uh, musician and, and a fascinating person. Um, uh, I mean, I just love Mendelssohn's music, but I think it was when I was in graduate school in Chicago when I started I was studying for my uh, music history comprehensive exams. I kind of went down the rabbit hole, kind of just learning about him and as a person, his family. His, his grandfather was a, a prominent uh, German Jewish philosopher, Moses Mendelssohn. His sister, Fanny Mendelssohn. Hensel, also a very accomplished composer and musician in her own right. He was involved in the Bach revival, which kind of brought Bach's music back to prominence in the 19th century, and on and on and on. Um, so, um, you know, and as Andrea already mentioned, he, you know, he wrote this, he was only 16 years old when he wrote this in 1825. Um, so just, you know, fascinating um, uh, person, and there's just so much interesting scholarship around him and his music. Um, so what I've kind of brought in, and we've kind of already kind of brought up the themes that I kind of, I just, I don't really have the, like specific questions and we can just kind of go wherever we want, but I've kind of got three main themes that I think would be fun for us to, to chat about related to this piece. And for each one, I just have a slide with some kind of musicological thing, that the kind of thing that my colleagues and I would work with. So I have an artifact, an analytical diagram, and a quote from a historical source. Um, so here's the artifact, first of all. Um, this is a table, and I first saw this, this picture in Ed Klorman's book, Mu Mozart's Music of Friends. Um, and this is a quartet table. It, it's kind of like a card table. You take off the top, and the music stands uh, fold up. Um, and presumably, you could actually put the top back on and, and you know, just play, play euchre or something on there as well, right? <laughs> um, because one of the, the things I really learned from Ed's book is you know, in the 18th century, that's much more what chamber music was. It was more like playing cards. It was something you did with your friends, something you did at a party, just a sociable, uh, a sociable thing, right? Um, and uh, this wasn't something that you rehearsed. This wasn't something that you went to a concert to see. This wasn't something you could do professionally, right? Um, this was just like hanging out with your, with your friends and, and a way to have fun and to connect with each other and, and so on. And then, uh, you know, in the early 19th century, around the kind of Beethoven's late quartets, court, you know, court, chamber music begins to be something that you rehearse, something you perform in a concert, and eventually we get, you know, this kind of change uh, or a new way of being uh, chamber musicians. So, you know, this octet is coming in the, in the 1820s, I think kind of right in the middle of, of this shift. And so I didn't know if you, if you had thoughts about this, about this as something you do with your friends, and a lot of you have re referred to that. I feel like that kind of aspect of, of this kind of music is still there on some level. But then also I feel like maybe some of the technical challenges of a piece like this are also pushing beyond what kind of a group of amateurs can do. And just whether that tension is kind of an interesting thing to think about. You know, so chamber music as just a social activity and then chamber music as a kind of very high level, kind of professional level uh, pursuit. I don't know if there's a tension between those things or you see both sides or, or if you have thoughts about that. Well, I, I'll go with the I wonder if the schism between amateur and professional in terms of uh, how well the two sides of that divide play is far greater than it was at that time. Right. So maybe you know more about that, Jonathan, than I do, but uh, that's one thing that I'm curious about. I, I'm also just looking at that picture. Do you know, is that picture uh, a period picture from around the 1820s? Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit later. It's from the 1840s. Well, you so know... It's the same, um, same type of table, so that's why I dug it out. I don't know anything about 19th century portraiture or art, but one thing that, you know, when, when you see um, portraits of people from that era, they're, they're sort of standing on ceremony, and, and appearance would, would be very important to them, and I'm struck by the incredible casual pose of the... Uh, of the people playing there, oh, yeah. and uh, it's, it's, I mean, it seems to me like the, the, the painter or the, the person, the artist is trying to draw our attention to how much of a, a leisurely, easy activity it is. Yeah, definitely. I think um, 
part of the reason why this group came together so nicely is because we, we all wanted to hang out. Right? It was a chance to, to hang out and have fun together and as well play great music. So, um, so I think about that social aspect for sure, because I mean, everyone here is so busy and I really thank all of you for taking time out of your schedule to come join us, but it was just so fun. And yesterday I couldn't stop smiling because it was just fun. And I just, I love the thing you said bef uh, in the, you know, before the, the, the performance of it being a party on stage. I thought that was just such a, an amazing way of putting it, right? Yeah, it's definitely a party on stage. <laughs> I might I might say something. I feel um, the more often we play, it doesn't matter if it's quartet, trio, octet. I feel like it doesn't matter anymore if it's on stage and it's like mm, broadcast or if there are ten people or a thousand. Or, or it, sometimes the the most lovely things happen just accidentally, and it's just we played it through before. Just this morning, it was just this exciting and and lively and and great and that's i think that's yeah that's great that's so it's it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't matter anymore for me yeah that's really interesting that having an audience here watching you do your thing it doesn't doesn't really change that much They must have done that sort of thing so much more than we do because they didn't you know there's no record players there's no there's nothing uh, to listen to pre-recorded stuff so we i mean we know that just about everything you can find in four hands or two piano versions or just right, if you wanted right. to experience this music you had to be up for it you had to be you know you gather together and you can only assume because as much fun as we had it's actually really hard <laughs> the octet like it, it's it actually is it's and it's very intricate and and we've played it so many times so it, it gets comfortable but uh it's hard to imagine some amateurs reading that though isn't it right, i don't know right. like that would be quite funny <laughs> <laughs> well, well and, it, and it is hilarious, you know, when you do yeah. get a group of, of folks who don't know it very well reading it, because, you know, the, the entries for coming in are, are, are actually quite seemingly random at times. And so it's almost like Mendelssohn is giving you a little bit of a challenge there in terms yeah. of you know, counting all your bars correctly. Like, in a way, the first violin part is the easiest that way because you're playing much of the time. But the other violin parts, I, you know, I find very challenging because especially when you have all those kind of fugal entrances, um, and I don't know, the Peter's edition that we all use, uh, you know, doesn't really have cues. Um, you really do have to count the bars. I think we're all waiting for whenever there's going to be, and maybe Jonathan, you could help, uh, you know, initiate this scholarly new edition <laughs> of the Mendelssohn Octet. I'm sure someone out there is working on it, but <laughs> yeah, we, we should check into that for sure. Um, Great. Well, maybe I'm going to just throw into the next thing because we can, we can kind of keep, keep moving back and forth. So, yeah, I mean, this, this kind of challenge of, of fitting together the entries, right, and fitting together the parts. I mean, I think this is like a lot of the fun for listening to it, right? And then the experience of being inside the octet and, and you know, having your one piece to kind of jump in when it's your turn is also, I think, part of the fun. Um, so this is, this is my analytical diagram. So... In some of my, I'll explain a little bit of what this is, but in some of my music theory work uh, right now, you know, when I teach music theory, uh, I'm teaching first year theory right now, which is mostly about chords and harmonies and then form and, and these kinds of things. And I love all that stuff. And there's such wonderful, rich, everything of that in this piece. But I think, you know, chamber music is so much about interaction. This is partially why going back to the 18th century, there's uh, you know, this metaphor of chamber music as a conversation, right? And I think this textural interplay where you know, parts are locking in together or splitting apart, right? That we might have eight instruments creating one thick layer or eight thinner layers at the same time. So this is something that I, in my, in my music theoretical work, am trying to get into, and it relates to um, perception, how our ears and our brains, our minds, group things together, right? We don't always hear, uh, you know, eight separate instruments. Um, so this is a, a network. I'm doing this kind of network analysis um, just to try to get the strength of the connections between, uh, between the different parts. And it's all based on uh, just kind of measuring how in sync the two parts are in terms of how, how you know, their um, notes start at the same time. 
Um, and then there's all kinds of statistical nonsense here and everything. But this is, this is a kind of snapshot. Obviously, in the piece, what's exciting is that the texture is constantly changing, right? And this is a frozen shot of the entire second movement and kind of who's most connected to whom. Um, and if you run a clustering analysis thing on this, um, and this is the same kind of analysis you would do with like social network uh, data if you had like somebody's Facebook contacts or their Twitter follows, whatever. If you do that, it actually kind of, there's, there's the lower, in that movement at least, there's a kind of lower instrument cluster and then the violin cluster, which I think you can hear right from the opening of that movement where that opposition is set up. Um, uh, so, in any case, this is something I'm trying to understand as a theorist. But I'm interested in your experiences as performers of locking in or interlocking or following these kinds of, you know, this textural um, interplay and, and how you experience that when you're rehearsing and when you're performing and, and thinking about these things. First of all, let me say it, that's really cool. Thank uh, you. <laughs> I, this is like Christakos works, right? The, this is the guy from... Is it Harvard who does all this interconnectivity mm -hmm. stuff? Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I love it. Uh, I'm fascinated by this topic in the sense that when you put the ensemble together, there are a variety of ways to actually seat the group, the groups, right? right? Yes. So you could have four violins here, then two violas and two cellos, which I think was the way I did it the very first time I learned it when I was a kid, I think. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, four violins, cellos here, and violas, and then you know, everything in between. And the, the version we did today, I actually think is really great. And that's the way I actually really prefer to do the Brahms sextets too, although people have an issue with that. I like trio versus trio, or trio against trio. And it brings out voicings and interplays that are, are really unique. So when we put it this way, there's only actually the second movement that jumps to mind where I'm very aware that the four violins are doing their own thing. Right. The other three movements of this particular piece, that never happens. So it's only that spot. Um, but I'm very aware of how Mendelssohn in this particular, like in the last movement and in parts of the first movement, the first cello and um, First, first cello and then the second quartet, if you look at it that way, that mm, interplay yeah. is really dense, quite thick. Where second cello and the first quartet, not as much. Right, so, right. So I, but that only came to my awareness because of the different seating patterns that I've used over the years. So. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I was we were actually just uh, talking about this before in the rehearsal that uh, for me it was the first time with this arrangement. I always mm -hmm. played it four violins so, and then violas, cellos. So that was so new for me and exciting because you could, if you could hear different interactions right. and other things got more clear and then I, I, I got myself thinking, okay, usually I, I'm looking there and now it's all the way over there <laughs> and it was so interesting and funny. That, um, and it's, I think I find it also very interesting that it, there's no plan for this. There's, it's not, it's no, right. it, it's not. Uh, it's not like some Steve Reich piece where like, there, here's the seating plan exactly. at the front of the score and you sit here and do this. And, yeah. and, and we were also rehearsing in, at Scott's place and it was a small room so we couldn't really sit in a circle or anything. So it also makes it so different. You sit here, you hear this voice much more clear than this. Mm -hmm. So. I think it's always like that. And that's why this, this table is so great, because you're as close together as possible. Yeah? You're really playing at each other. And I find right. that when we rehearse quartet, we do the same thing. So we don't sit in a quartet setting. We just play at each other. Yeah. Right, just in a circle yeah, right. around it. Yeah, absolutely. This, it's so interesting that you know, the seating choice could kind of be an, an interpretive choice, right? Um, something that we don't think about, like the staging of this, you know, um, but, it, but it clearly makes a difference. I mean, it was very interesting to watch this arrangement. You know, you get this sense of dimensionality, right? That you've kind of got kind of two quartets if you divide it side by side, but then there's also this kind of uh, depth to the way it's seating with the, with the kind of lower instruments further back. And like in the last movement, as the entries come, it feels like the music is like coming at us in a little, you know, in a, in a way, you know. Um, 
Yeah, I was going to say, it's kind of interesting to see that A1, like viola one, has the biggest circle, because wasn't, wasn't Mendelssohn a violist also? And so I imagine if he played with his friends, uh, you know, yeah. he, he got the most interactions with his friends. Right, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So, I mean, I don't want to, like, waste a lot of time on the technicalities of, of how the computer generated this, but, but the size of the bubble basically has to do with the strength and strength is actually the technical term in this kind of analysis, the strength of the connections between, between the parts. So that's showing that, yeah, in, the, in that movement, uh, I mean, the, the violin three and violin two are also pretty big. I'm not sure what the, how it actually comes out, but it's you're kind of more glued to, to the other parts, right? Um, and also, I mean, going back to Mark's point, I mean, uh, about uh, some of this, the, the networks for the other movements look very don't, are, don't all look like this, right? Um, so movement to movement, there's, there's a change in these things and moment to moment. Um, but I don't know if there are yeah, particular moments in the piece where, I mean, uh, where that sense of locking in or communication feels especially important for you. It seems to me like, like watching it, like there are these wonderful moments where you see two people who are locking in, either in octaves or, you know, or whatever. You see that locking in. That's, that's always fun to see. But then there's a different thing that happens when the whole octet comes together, right? Like those are such thrilling moments before the recap and the first movement, the end of the scherzo, these kinds of you know, moments. But you kind of don't have one person to look at, right? Um, so it's kind of distributed in a different way. I actually have something sort of sad to say. Um, these masks are not helping. Right, right. And uh, I think we all really, I mean, I saw a lot of nice eyes and, you know, a lot of very expressive eyes across from me, but I really miss being able to see more of my people, you know? It's hard. Yeah, definitely. It's really, really hard. <laughs> oh, just about the, uh, I mean, I was just wondering about the kind of interaction, right? The chain, yeah. the interplay, and how the parts... Well, Lock together I, or separate out. Right. Well, I, I think you know the one like totally together grouping moment is is in the first movement. You know when we yeah. get to that. You know da ta ta. You know, and, and we're all suddenly using the entire bow as well. And so it's just <laughs> like kind of. I, I know when I've heard mm -hmm. performances of it, it's like it's just kind of, you know, uh, that unification is very powerful. Oh yeah, for really sure. Really. And I mean, and some of those are difficult. I mean, the you know the big like unison passage before the recap is is one of the things where in a you know in in a group that has the twenty hours or whatever to work on it. I mean, you spend ten hours of that going through painstakingly trying to do intonation on all those little bits. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah, the the effect is marvelous. So. And I think you know one of the fun things about knowing the piece well is that you do have a catalog in your head. I think all of us have this. It's like, oh, I have this entry with second viola, you know. And so, like, right. part of it is like, do I know where to look exactly at the right time, you know? And like all these kind of, you know, great little insider things. Oh, that... Great when you look in the wrong person, <laughs> yeah. locked yeah. eyes with somebody. Yeah. It's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because it really is like all things, you know, it's like duets and there's, there's trio things right. and there's, you know, there's, so you have to kind of be aware of a lot of different voices at the uh -huh, same time. Totally. Yeah, there's the, the awareness of who has what and uh, I, I'm an inveterate uh, cue writer. I, anybody who knows my parts knows that it's, it's far too crowded with, with cues. It's just this <laughs> compulsion that I have and my... I pass it on to my students. And I always show them my, my scores. Um, but that's just the start of that awareness. And th there's knowing who has what. And then there's also knowing um, what's working and maybe what's not working on stage. Like today, for instance, um, in the first movement, there's this tricky thing and it's delicate where a whole bunch of people are going, ba da 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 da. And for, for me personally, that's technically hard, especially with our bowing, which is a good bowing, but getting that staccato in the upper half of the bow and s starting it at the right place with other people and ending it, it's difficult and it's exposed. And right. so it was one of these things where I was looking uh, to Anna Lee. I, I had her name in my part or her, her part in my part. And... Um, and I felt like we didn't quite have a, an agreement. And I did feel, Mark, that you kind of uh, 
um, sort of joined that conversation a little bit more and maybe added just an additional glue that I found helpful in just placing those things. And that's just, that's not about study, that's about sensing what needs to happen at a, at a given time, which is a, a different dimension yet. Yeah. Right. I'll just add too that given the, the wealth of experience that each of us t bring to the table, whether it be with this piece or just in general, um, there's also this wonderful gift that we're all offered at, at a certain point where due to that experience, oh, and especially with you guys that know the piece you know, very intimately, there's a flexibility that can happen in the moment. And that's, right. I think that's what Mark right. was alluding to, that, that sometimes you don't want to rehearse it too much because right. the minute you, t you plan on something exactly, of course, it's never going to work out that way anyway. Mm -hmm. So this way, everyone's antennas or antennae are like on alert. And um, there's, there's magic in that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and yeah, I think that's, that's such a great point that kind of you can do everything before or you can rationalize it, but in the moment, it's in the moment, right? Um, and these kinds of, you know, um, uh, if, you, if you think about this, you know, this, this task, and this is, I mean, I work with psychologists and cognitive scientists sometimes who really just frame, you know, the kind of thing that you, you've all just done on stage is really kind of miraculous when you, st when you start to think about it. The, the, the kind of grain of the fine grained kind of, like the temporal window between being together and not is so fine, right? And you're all kind of coordinating your whole bodies, your, your muscles, all of these things and an instrument to make this thing happen where a few milliseconds either way is really going to stick out, is going to be noticeable, is going to kind of break the, break the feel a little bit, right? Um, but these micro interactions, these micro timing differences, I mean, we can, as music theorists and people who, who kind of study performances, study recordings, we can zoom in and, and, and kind of come, you know, measure some of these things and measure things like typically in a texture, you know, the melody is actually a few milliseconds early, right? Um, but that's not something you can actually do consciously, right? It's something that musicians do very consistently and very well at a high level. Uh, but I feel like that's partially why you have to rely on intuition and just respond in the moment, right? Because you can't think to myself, oh, I'm just going to play a, you know, about five milliseconds early and then people will find it easier to follow me. You just have to listen and be present and, and respond um, and then, you know, and, and just follow these interactions as they, as they unfold. Um, I just, yeah. um, this this topic reminds me of why I enjoy playing the viola so much, because that's basically what the viola is always doing, is interacting with different uh, instruments, and always in a different way. Sometimes you're following, sometimes you're leading, sometimes you're somewhere in between. So yeah. this, this diagram f looks like how it feels, mm. and I, I just wanted to underscore what you said about it, so much of it being unconscious. Right. And uh, I, I, I'm looking for a word, I guess it's almost spiritual, that I feel like we're meeting on a different plane and speaking to each other there, and it's coming into our physical bodies. That's how it feels to me. And sometimes it's very conscious, like, okay, I have to look here. But sometimes it's just happening, and I think, oh, yeah, that's, that's working. Oh, that's right. nice. You know? Yeah, yeah, I think, and in fact, um, when you try to do it too consciously, that's usually the first problem like right, it right. starts to uh, you start to either follow or you, you know it's mechanical or there's something artificial about it and if you can turn off that side of the brain mm -hmm. um, that intuition is going to be the most accurate when you play right. from intuition you know with a guy on top kind of directing traffic but nevertheless if you're playing from intuition that's when you have real precision real precision right, the, right. The, when you think you're going to achieve precision by you know putting it in a headlock it, it just doesn't work. Right. It will strangle the, the creativity. Yeah, yeah. totally, yeah. totally. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think there is actually stuff in, in the brain, you know, like, I mean, for example, you know, we have multiple pathways for vision, right? So if you're driving and something comes out in front of you and you stop, 
often you do feel like you kind of stop before you consciously know what you've seen and stop. And that is because there actually are faster pathways in the brain that are just kind of more reflexy, kind of more automatic, more the kind of reptile brain, kind of older stuff. And then there's the more kind of conscious thinking kind of pathway as well, which is a little bit slower, right? And I think that kind of reacting in real time stuff, you know, it's kind of uh, very, very similar, um, uh, similar thing. And in terms of, you know, being the viola, so I'm also doing this with orchestral music, this kind of analysis, and also big band music, and I'm working toward doing it with some gamelan music and all kinds of chor big choral music and stuff like this, like the Talus 40 part motet makes a really cool network. Um, but when I did the opening of, of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, the viola part has a lot of arrows going out, kind of following everybody else, and sadly, almost no arrows coming in, right? <laughs> um, which, you know, kind of feels right for me, you know, as, as somebody who plays viola, like he's, you know, been in that situation, right? Um, I, I they're not really it. listening to me, but you know, that's okay, I'm doing my job, I'm contributing, you know? Um, <laughs> Uh, any, okay, let, maybe I'll get, get my last, no, go, go for it. It may look like there's no arrows coming in, but we have our ways of getting people to play with us. <laughs> as, yeah, also, as, true. As violas, we always say, you know, you would definitely know that something was missing if we, if we left the room. Oh, absolutely, yes. Well, and, and that's another, I, well, okay, I'll say one last thing about my silly networks, but, but sometimes another interesting thing to look at, actually, is a thing that they call betweenness. Because there are people who might not be the most kind of important looking node in the network, but if you take them out, the whole network falls apart because they're a bridge. Um, and so it's very interesting. So I think the viola part um, in, the, in that Beethoven uh, uh, symphony, it's also the clarinets, they're, the, they're a part that is more interconnected. And if you take it out, you kind of start to get more separate factions and you get a very different ultimate result. So it does really change, and there are a lot of different roles to play, but, but I'm gonna get rid of this, uh, of this uh, thing anyway, and, and go to my quote, which is my, my last kind of musicological thing to bring to the table. So I don't know if you've seen this before, but this is from a letter that Felix Mendelssohn wrote to his sister, describing the scherzo from the string octet. So he says, the whole piece is to be played staccato and pianissimo, the tremulandos coming in now and then, the trills passing away with the quickness of lightning, everything new and strange, and at the same time, most ingratiating and pleasing. One feels so near the world of spirits, carried away in the air, half inclined to catch up a broomstick and follow the aerial procession. At the end, the first violin takes a flight with feather-like lightness, then all must quickly fly. And that then all must quickly fly is a quote from uh, Goethe's Faust, um, from this fantastical, uh, dream scene in, in Faust where uh, the, the, the passage is train of clouds and flowering mist illuminate the sky reeds and leaves by wind are kissed then all must quickly fly so this imagery and this you know this way that he's describing the piece uh, to his uh, to his sister is, is all very very interesting to me and the, the imagery here the poet the connection explicit connection to poetry is there um, and so I'm kind of curious what you feel or how much you think about the kind of musical drama here of, of kind of weather imagery of some kind, um, however explicit or less explicit, comes into how you feel about this piece. Maybe another way of asking this question is, you know, what are you hoping to evoke or to communicate when you play this piece? Um, you know, like, not, it's not to say that the octet means something or means any one thing, uh, but it is certainly very meaningful and, and powerful in a, in, a, in a kind of, again, mysterious way. So I just kind of wonder how that factors in uh, when, you're, when you're playing a piece like this. Um, I, I, I think it would factor in if we didn't agree on what the uh, mood of a movement is, right. and then you have to talk about it, but I, we, I didn't have that feeling. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah. Maybe I can add, I mean, as a musician, at first we have to try to make it, make, like, realize what is 
in the music and it's it's written it's written everything pianissimo and the, so that's as, as an octet as an ensemble is for to begin with is so hard and um to you play to play pianissimo all the time and it was amazing today and it's like uh this is when you work on it and when you learn it this is the hardest thing you have to play basically nothing and then right. usually right. usually if everybody is on board like 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 this group then these things happen by itself so i think he it's not necessarily that you have to think of like a broomstick and like all these things. Right, right. They just, it's <laughs> just, I mean, this is just more like the mechanical, the musician's way of to think sometimes about these things. Coming. Yeah, absolutely. First question, do you have any idea when he wrote that letter to Fanny? Like how old he would have been? Because if he wrote this piece when he was, is it 16? Yeah. When, did, when is this letter from? I think my understanding, I have to go and check, but I'm pretty sure he, like, this is when he was, like, working on the piece. Scott, um, you have a thought on that? Well, no, I was just going to be because I, I, That's my sense. Oh, I see. Because we, this is like, she, she, ha she hasn't heard it yet. She doesn't know the piece yet. It's something oh, he's, I he's see. working yeah, on. Yeah, so it would be quite, because we, we have a, an autographed version of the score, which is quite different, and supposedly... You know, it was five years later that it was then oh, right. redone for publication. And there's actually some huge differences. I mean, like the whole first movement is in a different time signature with different, yeah. Like, so there, there's some, you know, kind of dramatic changes. I mean, not, not that that really changes anything about the scherzo, because I think sure, that's sure. still very much, although the, the tempo marking for the scherzo changed from that, um, from that initial one where, um, the, the marking that we have in our parts now is Allegro Leggerissimo, um, but originally it was just Allegro Moderato. And it's interesting oh, how Allegro Moderato, I think as a player, does make you feel differently. Like actually you would play it a little more settled and probably with less of the magic. The Leggerissimo kind of implies a certain, you know, filigree of, you know, stars and fairies and, you know, this kind of thing. So, right. So it's, yeah, so it would be interesting to know what his progression was. Like, was it in reaction to the first group that played it? You know, that he's like, that sounds tubby and ridiculous. You right. know, like, let's lighten it up. And th those are the things I always wonder about, you know, when, when composers make these changes like that. I mean, I think we're getting a little off the topic of your, of your question, maybe, but, well, that's but, good. To, that's fine. To, but to <laughs> continue down on this path, I mean, I often feel that composers, if they've written something that they know is great, then as they continue their journey as a composer later in life, they are constantly going back to that idea to use it again. You know, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beethoven did that all the time, all the time. And and if you, and like you think of Opus, like you think that what's the piano trio Archduke Opus number 96, 97. If you listen to the first movement of the Beethoven Archduke, it's almost like you could hear Beethoven sitting at his desk going, okay, now I need something really great. What's something really great I got? And it'll look, oh, Opus 59, number one, great. Okay, so I'll use the same rhythms and uh, same patterns. Okay, I'll do that here. And it's basically, I don't want to say regurgitated, but composers are doing that all the time. Right, right, right sure. Um, I feel like in, in, in this scenario, what he's revealing is his desire to have some large part of his output be in this zone. So later he would have written uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes, exactly. Uh, right. would, there's a whole pile of examples right. of things. Uh, the fantastical from kind the of piano scherzo is like a it, thing. In that's, Mendelssohn. A, that's a Mendelssohn exactly, thing. And, and, and in some ways, I, f I feel like he must have felt like, man, this is really a success of mine. I'm going to keep I'm going to keep doing this because this mm -hmm. is this is a trademark Mendelssohn thing. Yeah. And right. I, I, I just wonder about it because I don't know. I really don't know because you can't know, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't know where his mind was at when he was writing the piece. Who's so young? Sure. Um, but I'm fascinated to know actually that he, the version that we all know, was actually an updated version from the original autograph. Because that's also the, the same with the violin concerto. There is a first version that was actually published before the version we now hear all the time. Right. And while we definitely play the later version of that, like we play the later version of the octet, um, it is interesting to see where it came from. Because the first movement of the violin concerto is entirely different. It's a completely right. different beast. And the second movement has a whole different midsection. It, it's just, he, he, I think like Beethoven later, or Beethoven as well, so I should say, like Beethoven also just kind of, okay, I'm going to get rid of that because that didn't work, and I'm going to go back to something that really did work, and I'm gonna, I'll put that in there instead. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting, kind of lightness is maybe a kind of fingerprint for, for Mendelssohn, right? An aesthetic value, something he wanted to cultivate in a lot of his music, right? Um, uh, you know, just that that feeling, you know? 
I'm thinking back to your original question about whether we have these kinds of images. And I would say for me the short answer is no. Right, yeah. And I'm wondering, I don't, I wonder if he would have talked to his sister about this if she was able to hear it. If he would have, I think this is this sort of, I suspect what he needed to do, he wanted to talk about it and translate the music into words and that wouldn't have been necessary if she was there. Right, yeah, that is very interesting. Sort of second best kind of. Yeah, right. Well, and this is the kind of, I mean, this series is supposedly called Talking Music, right? And this is the kind of paradox that I find myself in as a music, you know, that I write about music, that I try to evoke something or think about, you know, to talk about music in words is kind of this um, enterprise that's always doomed to fail, right? You know, <laughs> there's, there's nothing we can say up here that's going to be as good as just what we actually heard just hearing the piece, right? But at the same time, because we love this piece so much, I feel like we felt compelled to talk about it because we love it, you know, but it can never, the, the words can never replace the music. Um, but yes, it, I, think it's, I think it's a fair answer, though, to say, like, you don't really think about these things. When you're playing, there's so much going on, right? That like, the last thing in your mind is like, oh, this is kind of like being on a broomstick. Like, you've got like, <laughs> you're kind of already maxed out, right? Like, yeah. to like add in like, oh, well, that would be fun. But, um, you know, uh, yeah. You know, what's funny is I think that, that it's not so much like a, a, a broomstick. What we will often do when we're playing anything, we'll be playing Saint-Saëns and we'll say, oh, this is like a Mendelssohn scherzo. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> so we start making references among the music themselves. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting too, interpreting one kind of music through another kind of music, yeah. right? Yeah, just like I was thinking in the, in the, in the, in the Ravel, Right, which is another amazing, another amazing piece, a piece that I love. But you know, parts of that just really rocked, you know, <laughs> um, and that was just kind of the visceral feeling that I got in that. Right. I don't. I think you should keep doing what you're doing, though. I have to say, like uh, the, the the question of whether I think in, I'm not sure if the are you asking if we think in concrete terms, like little narratives and stories and images and and or or just. Uh, because I think I it's I, I think I think it's worthwhile to, to put it into words. I think you know mm -hmm. to kind of link it to something. It doesn't have to be so poetic, but it, you know it, I I find it very helpful. And when people are good at it, and they you know they play a piece, it's beautiful, and then they describe some of the piece. I find that I can like even as a seasoned musician, I can go oh yeah right oh right. play that again right. And then, you know, somehow it opens up other worlds. So I think it's a very worthwhile thing to describe. Yeah. I, I mean, there, there is certain research happening in, in, in my field right now, thinking a lot about music and narrative, uh, music and meaning, how music can kind of open up a, a kind of virtual world or, or virtual characters that you feel there's a personality there or, or, or feelings there, these kinds of things, right? I mean, for a long time, a lot of people in my field have just kind of discounted that and just want to talk about the notes in a very abstract way without, without touching what they mean because that's kind of very messy, right? Tom, Tom um, can you give them the, you have to give them the URL for the, the Courteau thing you showed me yesterday because that's, oh, yes. I mean, both well, exactly what we're talking about and also hilarious. Well, in case you ever uh, are inclined and have some time, the, the, the great French pianist Alfred Courteau, he, he gave a, a master class on on Schumann Kinderzehn, and, and it's sort of poetic uh, in, the, in the extreme in a way you just don't see anymore. And he's, he's sitting at the piano and narrating as, as he plays. And well, you, you would just have to see it, but it's yeah. somehow related to what you're talking about. He talks about. as he's playing, and he describes what the next gesture is and what the next scene is, and, how, and then now here it comes. And, and I mean, he's a poet, <laughs> it's incredible. It's also very funny. <laughs> well, and and this, is also, this is also, again, to put on my historian hat again, of course, this is also a kind of cultural shift, a historical shift, right? Around this time in the 19th century, the idea of program music starts to come up, the idea of associating a piece of music with a poetic text or a painting or a play in a, di in a different way, right? The idea that you know, music can be a medium that can depict and represent in this way starts to become important in a way that it wasn't really 
in necessarily in other times and places, right? Um, and uh, some musicologists have argued Mendelssohn was actually kind of at, at the forefront for this kind of uh, this kind with his you know, symphonic poems, the Hebrides, things like like this. You know, using music to evoke a scene um, is is something that was kind of distinctive, and maybe people don't appreciate how much of an innovator he was with that stuff because so much of it is light or fun or kind of just pleasing, you know, it, because it doesn't feel like it makes you work so hard, you know, um, compared to some of the other kind of things in that uh, vein, but he was kind of early on in that. Um, I just, it just occurred to me that, of course, when we're teaching, we often use images to try to get across an idea. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, so it's something that we're using all the time. I didn't mean to denigrate the importance oh, no, of no, words no, of in relationship to music. But it's, it's an interplay between the two, yeah, for sure. Definitely. The, and yeah, we're often using images and creating a scene and using words to create a mood that a student can latch onto. So yeah. it's definitely a part of what we do all the time anyway, yeah. Yeah, oh, totally. And I think, I mean, one of the wonderful things is that there's not one right or wrong way to experience a thing like this, right? Uh, and, and even if you're kind of in the same mode, you might have different images in your head or different emotions in your heart. And it's kind of, that's, that's kind of one of the wonderful things, right? I mean, we as an audience can be together but individual in a way that's kind of parallel but different from the way that the players on stage are all together but also individual at the same time. Um, in any case, now I'm just kind of rambling. But um, we're almost out of time here, and, and we do have to clear the hall because there's so much happening at Western uh, this weekend. We have the Parsons and Poole concert later today. I understand that a couple of the student ensembles, the wind ensemble, the symbolic band have concerts this weekend as well. So there's just so much music making uh, happening here and so much going on. So I feel like we should, we should wrap up, although I want to keep talking about this uh, for, for lots longer. Um, I'm just going to put up a quick plug. The next event in this Talking Music series uh, will be my colleague Jay Hodgson, uh, professor in the Department of Music Research and Composition who specializes in popular music. Um, and he's going to talk about how George Martin made the Beatles, like made the group who they are, um, using uh, Strawberry Fields Forever as a case study. And I, I'm, I'm super excited for this. I think this is going to be really great. Uh, he's a really uh, great speaker and really knows his stuff when it comes to uh, record production, how, you know, how records are made. Um, so that's on uh, November 26th at 1.45. And of course, there are many more concerts in this Friday's at 12.30 uh, uh, series coming up. Um, and we're all looking forward to the time when all you people on the internet can, can be in here sitting with us as well again. Um, but yeah, thank you all. Thank you all for, for agreeing to do this and for, for such a wonderful conversation. And thank you all for being here. Uh, take care, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.